So, Lauren, thanks for uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, let's start, if you would, please, by describing your current position and uh, recent positions and academic uh, background. Sure. Well, I currently serve the University of Michigan <clears throat> as the Associate Vice President for Student Life. Uh, probably the easiest way to describe the duties, I suppose, is to uh, say that I supervise residence life and university housing, our student unions and student activities, recreational sports programs, uh, uh, dining services, conferences, capital projects for student life, of which we've been quite engaged in recent years, and some of our sustainability initiatives. I, I often, I will say though, um, describe the duties and then say, frankly, that's the job description. I think of my role honestly, as really trying to create environments and opportunities for students to participate and lead. So I often like to tell you the duties, the job description, and then also really what I think the work is rather than what the job is. Um, most recently, I've been here uh, 10 years, eight years in the role that I just described. And prior to this, I've worked at several other universities, including Indiana University, uh, Southeast Missouri State University, University of Hartford, and then a short stint at Kutztown University in Pennsylvania. And my uh, academic background, first of all, my work has always been in student affairs and student auxiliaries and higher education for about 25 years now. And my academic training, of course, is along the same lines with uh, a master's degree in higher education and a uh, doctorate in educational leadership and policy. Let's, let's talk about some of those areas that are within your responsibilities. Um, let's talk about housing first. The, the kinds of uh, housing that's being provided now, the challenges you see in the future for um, on-campus housing, and in general how you view the importance of that as a part of the overall uh, student life picture. Right. Well, I would describe housing's challenges in a couple of ways. One is there are sort of um, the challenges of having a very intensive, financially intensive and physically intensive asset called university housing and whether that's attractive to students and the challenges we face in managing it. And the other bucket I suppose would be then what opportunities or challenges it creates for the learning and the community building that, that we want to see happen. So first of all, we have about 10,000 students here at the University of Michigan. It is not the largest housing system in the country. There are larger systems and so we're perhaps representative but there are others who are faced with more challenges um, we have about as I said 10,000 students about 99 percent of our first year students choose to live on campus we do not have a housing requirement that's a good sign we take that as a good sign we have about 1500 apartments that are occupied by graduate students postdoc students and some undergraduate students all of that inventory is very old in fact the average square foot of housing on our campus today is about 50 years old. And we've gone a very long time without investment into those facilities. So we are, have just, well, we are completing this next fall phase two of what we call the residential life initiatives, which is a fairly comprehensive investment in our dining and uh, housing facilities. Total of which is about $650 million uh, as of this fall over the last 10 years. So you can see already that the challenge is a very old physical plant, a uh, very capital intensive asset to manage, yet a strong commitment to that experience. And so we're faced with this paradox, in my opinion, of how is it we can maintain an asset that's this capital intensive and this old when we so highly prize what happens inside these residence halls, which is community building and participation and leadership and exposure to ideas and people uh, and perspectives and foods that are different than these students brought with them to college. So we are going to have to find, I think, uh, alternative ways to deliver on that commitment because we value the experience, but it's very, very expensive and very, very old. And uh, we're gonna have to find some new ways to do that, I think. Let's, let's peel the onion on that just a, just a little bit. Uh, historically, uh, some institutions have not had as much of their student body uh, in um, university-owned or college-owned housing. They relied either on uh, uh, commuting or 
they've relied on more um, general housing within the within the community. Um, can we talk some more about the value of that uh, residence um, experience? Sure. I, I guess the first thing I think is that we are very fortunate in this country to have such a plethora of types of institutions of higher education. Indeed, I think it's why so many people come to this country to study. And thank goodness, I think, that we have um, uh, community colleges, four-year residential, private, public, <clears throat> um, a secular, non-secular, religious affiliated. It's just really a great uh, portfolio that's available for the kind of learning uh, that students are seeking. That said, I've made my career, of course, in um, mostly public, one private, but mostly public, and in all cases, residential institutions. And it is for me because I think it's so important. So, so here's here's the way I think about it. Um, I guess what I would say is um, it's important we understand the distinction between knowledge and learning. Knowledge might be thought of, for example, and I'm sure there are others who will offer a better definition than me, but knowledge might be this um, requisite set of information that I have up here in my head. It's cognitive. Learning quite possibly is best done in experience. And so um, I can read about Spain, for example, and become quite adept in understanding it in a, in a cognitive way, very different for me. And I lived in Mexico for a year in high school, and I lived in England for six months in college and traveled through Europe. And my understanding of those places is shaped so much differently than had I just read about it. So I think it's really important in our case, in our residence halls, that we think about these residence halls and our recreation facilities and our union facilities and really all of our facilities that are dedicated to student life as places to introduce or to allow the collision of ideas and perspectives to occur. So we need to be very intentional that we have spaces and places for programmed exposure to ideas and unplanned serendipity and collision to occur. Um, I'm the average kid who grew up in a town of 2,000 people on a farm uh, and went to college not even knowing what he needed. But I'm the average kid. And it was in college and through college and frankly a great career where I get to uh, do this kind of work that I began to realize the world is bigger than the one I knew. So place-based education, residential environments, housing, I, I really think offer those kinds of experiences. Um, for students to uncover their own value system and make sense of it in the context of other people, to know themselves as a citizen of a community and what it would be like to be in or out of that community. So I, I just think it's really valuable and that's why I've made my career in, in residential place-based universities. There's one other, um, one other aspect I'd like to get into of that um, um, aspect of awareness of a broader world. The uh, University of Michigan has uh, uh, taken a, an important stand towards supporting diversity in, in campus environment. Uh, without getting into that history necessarily, talk with us about the your view of the importance of, of diversity on campus as a part of that learning experience. Right. <clears throat> well, I am an optimist by nature. It'd be difficult to do this kind of work with young people, especially without being an optimist. But I will say that my perspective, and I think the universities, and really, frankly, much of higher education's uh, perspective is the world can be a very complex, is a very complex, sometimes broken place. And our obligation is to prepare people, students especially, to enter into communities, enter into organizations and companies and not-for-profits, enter into society more prepared to make sense of it and help resolve it. Uh, and so the, the place to begin to become exposed to that, practice the solutions, learn more about it, it is on our campuses. And there are, there are lots of data, of course, that say something about what, what the percentages of um, 
you know, people of color in our country or in our communities are, et cetera. So we, we really need to actually, I think, prepare students to live in the world, not just the U.S. world, but the world, and uh, help resolve issues of peace and justice wherever they might occur. Sometimes that's a company, and sometimes that's a community. Um, this is a great place to do that, and it's a great place to actually be ignorant about what it means to live in a diverse world. Diversity is, uh, I have come to learn, diversity is not something that's mastered. One does not become an expert at it. It is a journey. I am still learning myself. I need the confrontations uh, in my life for me to be challenged on my perspective and my views. I need to understand what it's like to give up the ability to be an expert at something because I'm not in somebody else's shoes. Let them author their own experiences. College is a great place to um, be a little ignorant about it, to experiment with values and, and judgments and perspectives, to be pushed back on those things, and for it to be safe um, when there's far more risk once one leaves. Yeah, the safeness of the environment is, uh, is much more than just the physical safety. It's having an environment that's uh, supportive of, the, of learning in in so in so so many ways um, we understand the the nature of the University of Michigan but but you're part of a network of folks uh, throughout the country that are engaged in the questions of student life um, how do you see the challenges for your colleagues who have less residential uh, on their campuses to be able to achieve uh, at least some of the values of, uh, that are um, almost implicit in having a, a, a campus that's occupied 24-7. Uh, right, well one of the reasons I like to introduce an answer to the question, what do you do for a living, with sort of two parts. One is the job duties and the other is the work. The one is the job, one is the work, is because to, in many ways we are advantaged with a residential campus or a student union building or a recreation building or a dining center that others may not have in the work. But the work doesn't change, in my opinion, for an institution, particularly public ones who have a responsibility to their community, to their states, to the public good. So th I'm sure, I know that the work can be different. My um, Lots of friends work in campuses that don't have these facilities, but the nature of the work is the same. We just have to find different tools. And let me offer a metaphor that we like, to, or analogy that we like to use here on our campus as a shorthand. So we will talk about the difference between the math and the nine. By that I mean this. So for you, if I if I were to ask you, how how do you get to nine? You might say ten minus one, and I might say five plus four, and another person might say three times three, and we sometimes get so wrapped up in what whose math is correct that we forget or maybe even aren't sure if we're talking about the same nine. And if we can actually agree on the nine, that is the work in this case, almost any math will get you there, or at least the math is less relevant than making sure we get to nine. So that's a way for me to say that residence halls for us are the math. There's an incredibly powerful nine that comes from that. But we've got to get to that nine on any campus we serve. And the obligation of colleagues, student life colleagues at other universities, especially public ones for the reasons I mentioned, is to make sure we're in the same, we're talking about the same learning outcomes, the same citizenship and life skill development, the same sort of community engagement capabilities, whatever those tools or that math might be. I, I really like that, that metaphor. It's wonderful, wonderful. Well, I'm, I'm stealing it from my colleagues here on campus. I didn't invent it, but it has become a very useful tool for us, yeah. Uh, let me ask about the continuing um, value of a student center or a student union uh, in that uh, a lot of student activity in life takes place in a, in a digital realm, uh, access to a variety of informations and networks that are not place-based. Um, are student unions still relevant? 
I think student unions are incredibly relevant, probably because of this shift to a much more virtual and digital world. I think student unions, student centers, university centers <clears throat> are going to have to figure out how to retain the relevance and how to be, how to embrace that sort of technology in that world um, in ways that are a little different than the past. All that is to say, uh, our, the past is useful for informing the future, but we can't live there anymore. Now, how is it relevant to, in my, to my way of thinking? It is really hard to form community if we're not in relationship with each other. It is really hard to have my, my, my views challenged, for me to understand where you're coming from uh, unless we sit across from each other. Um, Michigan is a, a big football school. The game is fundamentally different on TV than in the stadium. Uh, it is back to sort of learning versus knowledge. I can email colleagues and it's very literal and we have an exchange of information. I can see on Facebook people's posts. It is different when we talk about the conflict or the values. It is different when we're sitting next to people who are excited, as excited about what's happening on the football field versus me watching it on television. So it, it doesn't to me, there is room in this great big landscape I talked about earlier with higher education for virtual ways to learn. I, I think there's absolutely room for that. But I don't think it's an either or, and I don't think it renders something therefore less relevant. Um, <clears throat> we have a very big campus. <clears throat> we have a north campus. It's about three miles from the central campus, the historic original central campus. And our north campus has four schools and colleges and about 3,000 students living there. And um, uh, there's a, a regular conversation about how it feels remote and distant. And there are many who think, well, we can bridge that with technology, that we don't need campus transit and buses in the same way because we have technology. And I, I argue often that that's not the case, that we can't, technology is a great thing for a lot of things. It won't replace the human relationships, the nature of how we manage and uh, learn to deal with conflict and values clarification. It just won't replace those things. So the student union is a place for conflict to be welcomed. It's not community is not free of conflict. That's probably the place I should start. Community is not free of conflict. I have conflict in my home, and it's a great it's a great community. But the student union is a place where that can be explored and checked and understood and managed. And we welcome protests in the union. When students are feeling like this university doesn't hear them and they want to go to a place that they feel like they can be everything they want to be and say everything they want to say, the student union is a great place for them to say, we don't feel heard and we're going to demand that you listen to us. It's, it's safe. It's embraced. And then we try to navigate and teach and work through it. Lauren, what do you believe that the questions or challenges that higher education faces today um, as far as ensuring its uh, future viability? It's a big question. Um, there are lots of opinions, I'm sure, on this. I'll, I'll offer sort of a meta observation, I guess. I, I, my sense of higher education today is um, that the national narrative is quite shrill. There are questions about whether it is the public good uh, it, it's long been regarded as. The concerns about the cost of attendance are incredibly high. In some states, um, I would say there's almost political hostility relative to higher education. And so the answers become somewhat simple. Um, less money sent on things that look like quote unquote fluff, things that are easily categorized into academic versus non-academic. Uh, the answers sometimes are simply, um, as you were questioning earlier, about m maybe we move to an online cheaper form because of cost of attendance. And if we're confused, back to the nine versus the math, that is the, 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 the purpose versus the means, if we're confused about the purpose of education, I think those answers start to look attractive. And so the challenge to me in higher education is one of assuring that uh, we do a better job um, with the narrative about the purposes of higher education, that we have relationships that are stronger with parents and students and legislators and those that sort of define the narrative, 
that we get as efficient as we can be. The, the public and those who are critical about higher education, I don't think are wrong about being efficient. That's our responsibility to be as efficient as possible, but without losing the purpose of higher education in the meantime. When you boil it down, uh, at least in student life, much of the way we fund what we do is through things like student fees or through room and board rates that create reserves that we spend on those things. And we're going to have to ask ourselves in student life, I think, are we doing as much as possible with the money we have available? Are we responsible to the people we serve with what we're charging? Is, is the nature of what students are involved in just activity or is it activity at least some kind of learning and growth and development? Um, so I think that kind of obligation is going to sort of show up, if you will, for, for student life folks too. Higher education stressed. I, I guess the other thing I would say is it strikes me as um, exactly the time courageous leadership is needed at all levels of a university. And it's exactly the time at which courageous leadership is risky and it's a little frightening. So when people are concerned and the scrutiny is high and the accountability is clear and money's not available and so you have to be very wise about where you spend it, that our, our natural inclination as humans is to run out, out of the fire. But we need people who are gonna run in at the same time. So I think the other issue for education is there's a need for incredibly courageous leadership, particularly from presidents and boards. Uh, but, you know, leadership happens where it needs to happen inside an institution, and it's not a position, it's, a, it's an approach. It's, I, I, we probably need it in all forms of student life as well. Well, it's certainly a challenging, it's certainly a challenging time as we see uh, state, deport, uh, state financial support decline to uh, historically low levels for public institutions such as yours. Uh, it's happening across the country um, to a, to a uh, significant extent. And the conversation about higher education as a public value as opposed to a personal good will, will continue for some time. And I appreciate your observations that there's always the opportunity to be um, more uh, cost effective uh, in the need to in the need to do that in a variety of ways at the same time if I understand your point of view you're saying you don't close the student union to save a little bit of money I, I think that's absolutely right and it is it is not uncommon never has been uncommon that somebody would say well that is fluff particularly when times are tight, finances are tight, scrutiny is high, uh, it's easy to bifurcate the way we think of the university as the academic stuff and everything else. To me, the problem is until we understand uh, the, 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 the importance of, or we in student like to do a better job of explaining learning as something that happens where the students are versus uh, only in a classroom. I'm, this is by no means meant to diminish that um, the reason people come to college, I recognize, is really oriented around majors in the curriculum. But universities have always um, been fundamentally about producing people prepared to contribute in some way to their companies, their cities, their communities, their society. And that's the kind of learning that happens in student unions, in um, you know, rec uh, sports teams, in community service programs, in the, the dance marathon that the students organize and raise money for and learn from. So I, I absolutely think uh, that's not the time to close the student center. And we've got to do a better job, in my opinion, of explaining its value. We need more evidence. We need to be a little more data-driven and empirical in our orientation. Not to diminish that this is sociology work where it's qualitative in nature. But we have to just get better, I think, at explaining its value, making sure it is of value, and then executing in a way that achieves a nine or an outcome or a, an important sort of university accomplishment. Hmm. I'd like to uh, conclude our, our conversation by asking you to speculate about the future of campuses, the future of, um, 
of uh, campuses, perhaps such as uh, uh, the one where you are now. Uh, as you think about being able to uh, continue their value uh, for, the, for the long term, how, how do you and your colleagues think about that, that question? If, and I'm sure you do, uh, by every action that you take, decisions that you and your colleagues make, uh, you're in effect creating the next uh, future for your institution. How do you think about that? Well, I think, I guess my perspective is we are at the beginning of that futuring. It, see, it feels to me like there is a moment here, and the moment is, you know, the last few years and the next few years, and so it's really hard to speculate, I think. The technology advancements that we've talked a little bit about, the um, increasing accountability, the stress in the economy nationally, which has created some of the narrative we have today, all those things are fairly recent if we look at the long-term history of higher education. So it feels a little early to me, but I do have a, a, a couple of thoughts that are not rooted necessarily in lots of my own analysis other than just sort of intuition and thinking. And that is this country, as I mentioned, is blessed with something like 4,000 institutions of higher education. Mm -hmm. And I think it's possible that it will be difficult that they're all in existence in 30 years. Um, places like the University of Michigan or Michigan State or Ohio State or other institutions like them will be fine. I don't know what they'll look like. They will be fine. I think places that are far more tuition dependent where the, um, the nature of tuition discounting as a practice, which is pretty common, uh, uh, that's going to be challenged. I think when they're remote or they're not distinctive in some way, I think they're gonna be challenged a little bit. Um, that's unfortunate because I actually think it's incredible the portfolio of higher education institutions we have in the country, but I think that's a possibility. I think also student life folks and higher education folks in general, uh, we're going to have to find new ways to fund what we believe in or we're going to have to get clearer on our missions and that we can't be all things to all people Michigan, for example, does not offer journalism. At one time we did, years ago, we don't offer a journalism program. I don't know how that decision was made. I'm sure it wasn't easy. Um, Dan Rather is a graduate of the University of Michigan. Uh, but, but the decision making around what we can do really, really well as an institution, I think that's gonna have to, to happen at these universities as well. Student life, um, if I think about my own world, um, I think we're going to have to, as I was saying earlier, get more creative about how we achieve our objectives. I think funding is one example. I don't think the student fee model and the general fund or E&G, the university allocation of budget money in the same way is going to be there. Perhaps most of the allocations will go to the most acute situations like mental health concerns, concerns of this around drinking, sexual assault, the things that get in the way of learning versus the things that we've historically looked to like student activities. We're gonna to have to be really creative about how to do those things or be clearer about what things are the, the most prior, uh, biggest priorities. Well, if, if we accept the premise that the residential experience has the, the values that we've been talking about, at the same time recognize the um, vulnerability of some institutions that don't have the heft and inertia of the Michigans, Michigan States, Ohio States, Minnesota, University of Georgia, University of Texas, the flagships uh, that uh, have um, ample size, momentum, uh, and uh, are significantly more wealthy than other institutions. Is there a way for us to imagine a uh, low residential model? That is, an environment or a, a model in which only a portion of the four years is spent in a residential setting uh, that we would characterize as traditional. Um, that 
begins to bring some of that value, perhaps not all, but does it in such a way such that um, it's uh, more economically possible to be able to do that. Could you join me in speculating on, on what a low, we'll call it a low res model might, might look like? Yeah, I tell you, let me start by saying a little bit about why I think this matters and then how it is we can assure what matters exists even in a different model. So first of all, we know, for example, from all kinds of research, one of which is the, the National Survey of Student Engagement, that st when students are engaged with faculty, with each other, with peers, with staff outside of the classroom, their learning is enhanced. So that engagement is important for the learning. We know that from research. There's no need to reinvent that. We know, for example, particularly uh, here at Michigan, as you mentioned earlier, and what we believe is that diversity matters for a well-rounded education and matters for the ability uh, that our graduates need to have in society, in the world that is diverse. We know that matters. So we need the kinds of spaces and places where students will collide with ideas and foods and people and, 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 and philosophies and perspectives that are different than they brought to college. And relative to learning, we need the kinds of spaces and places where students can engage with faculty, peers, and, and, and other people outside of the classroom so that their learning is enhanced. We know, um, we know that there's a body of research around this notion of mattering. That is to say that students um, are more likely to persist through college, graduate, matriculate, when they, when, when, they're, when they feel like they matter to other people. Their mental health is enhanced. Learning is enhanced. So we need spaces and places where private and confidential treatment can occur, doctors, therapists, and places where the civic activity can occur, where they know they come to know themselves as part of a community, that they matter in that community. And as Carney Strange talks about, that if they weren't there, there'd be a hole in that community. So all those things are so important in my mind, and I think the research would, would suggest this, that we've got to find ways to not lose that then the model, whether it's a, a shorter version of that, we simply have to create a model that we can assure those kinds of things happen for learning reasons and community reasons and societal reasons. I don't think it has to be four years in a residence hall. In fact, uh, we house mostly first year and some sophomore students. We have no requirement, and it's a very, very healthy thing. I don't think we should build housing for more students. Actually, I think it's a healthy thing to help them transition to an independent life in the community. Um, now, th that's the model before the cost concerns and other things we were referencing earlier. But there may be other ways to do this. It might be the case that um, it's clearly a first year experience or it is um, uh, it might be the case that our diversity programming we do with our RAs or our leadership programming we do in our student union can be taught in different ways. It doesn't have to be residential or in the student organization. I, I don't know exactly what that would look like, but I think it's possible. And we do this in this country in a reasonably expensive mode that is being questioned. I think it's an ideal one. It's the best one. But um, if we're responsive and responsible, we have to be open to exploring whether it could be done with short-term housing or different forms of teaching, community building, and leadership and, and grassroots organizing through a curriculum or through um, short -ter shorter-term engagements than a semester-long experience. Um, in fact, I would argue that places like Michigan could learn a lot from community colleges. Um, most of which or many of which don't have the residential footprint we have, don't have student union footprints we have. But I have seen a really, uh, I've seen some good leadership, student leadership, activism coming from, from those places. So we, we probably have in our portfolio of higher education some examples we, if we could just learn to talk to each other, the big four-year residentials and the two-year community and the private, the religious, the secular, if we could just learn to learn from each other, I'll bet there's a model that we could, we could deploy somehow, or models. Well, let me conclude by asking um, for other observations that you would have for 
folks who are aspiring to understand uh, colleges and universities from a, from a campus planning perspective? Well, we have done quite a bit here in the way of facility renovations and construction and <clears throat> have quite a bit scheduled. I guess the, the one thing that comes to mind in response to that question is for all of us, including student life folks, to remember that when we're planning campuses, whether they be public and civic spaces or outdoor or buildings, that what we're really attempting to do, in my opinion, is make manifest the values, the aspirations, the unique characteristics of the campus versus uh, new paint, better plumbing, and beautiful spaces. Those matter as, as sort of uh, vehicles to something, but we have to be clear that um, the building or the space is the way in which we make manifest aspirational or values sort of laden hopes. And I, I see this a lot with our own staff. So I would tell you a recent project we're involved in here, there's a little bit of a tension in the project between student perspectives about what we need and the staff who will run the building and what they know. And one of the things that struck me, one of the things I said, because I was looking for a way to just sort of get us out of this log jam was to say, somehow we have to all be experts at the part we're experts at and find consensus. So for example, students are the expert authors of the experience they see. So let's give them that authority and that expertise. We don't need to actually tell them the experience they need to have. They know something about what they're seeking in this experience. Our staff who are gonna run the building are the experts at that particular content area that we call fill in the blank. Our architects, planners, and engineers know more than I have forgotten more than I will ever know about design and the engineering of the building, the, the, the structural systems and all those sorts of things. And so it's not important. In fact, we should probably avoid trying to actually get an outcome I need out of this when in fact I'm only the expert at the portion that I'm bringing to the table. So I think for planners and architects, if you can help facilitate that kind of understanding with two ears and one mouth, as I often have to remind myself, two ears and one mouth, <laughs> um, we can create that aspirational values laden, uh, something that exceeds even what we thought could be possible in these rather than a really beautiful building that serves one need that was in a, not well informed by other expertise. Um, that's probably my biggest perspective is, uh, is these are such opportunities. It's so hard to get the money together. It's usually a political exercise as much as a financial one. And it's, it's a moment not to be lost to do something really transformative, whatever it is on a college campus, getting harder and harder for all the pressures we face. It's a real opportunity to make manifest something really important for the university. And that's not easy. So I appreciate what, what, uh, what you and your colleagues are doing. 